We're talking this morning about the one thing that God wants, and that's trust. Uh, When Jesus was born, it was a time of confusion for the people of Israel. Uh, They were very dark days in the life of the nation of Israel. It had been 400 years since a prophet had spoken to God's people. 400 years since they heard from God. Uh, They must have wondered, why isn't God speaking? Uh, We've waited a long time to hear his voice. When is he going to speak? Uh, They were an oppressed people living under Roman rule. Even though Rome allowed some degree of religious freedom, they were not a free people. And they must have wondered, why are we, the chosen people of God, under such oppression, and how much longer is it going to be? I want you to think of the confusion in Mary's life, surrounding Mary's pregnancy. Uh, She was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. How do you explain that to anybody? It makes a good story, but, you know, there's no way people are going to understand that. Uh, Joseph finds out, and he's determined to end the relationship. She's been unfaithful to him, as far as he can tell. If an angel hadn't spoken to Joseph, he would have terminated the relationship. But Joseph obeyed God and took Mary to be his wife. But you can't tell me that there wasn't confusion and some fear and lots of questions that surrounded that event. Now, sometimes, sometime during that pregnancy, uh, Joseph and Mary were informed that they had to go to Bethlehem and register because of a census. Now, you have to understand, they were going to have to travel 90 miles to Bethlehem. She was nearly nine months pregnant. She didn't jump in a car and drive down. She went by foot or by horseback. It's like walking from the church to Rehoboth Beach. Now, I want you to think about that, okay? That's a journey by foot. We're on horseback and nine months pregnant. There had to be some confusion there, like, God, uh, why now? Aren't you in control? Couldn't you have intervened and delayed the census a little bit? They didn't understand. Now, Mary and Joseph were also very poor people. The scriptures tell us that uh, eight days after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph went to Jerusalem to offer sacrifice to God according to the Old Testament law. And they gave two turtle doves as an offering. But if you go back to Leviticus chapter 12, you discover that Leviticus 12 says that they were obligated to give a one-year-old lamb. And sort of like a little burger dot after that, but if you're extremely poor, if you're at the bottom of the ladder economically, you could give two turtle doves. And Mary and Joseph give two turtle doves. I wonder what she thought. Here I am, highly favored of God, I'm carrying the Son of God. Couldn't God have let us register after Jesus' birth? And doesn't God know that this trip from here to Bethlehem is is going to bring some unwelcomed additional expenses, like we're going to have to find lodging and we're going to have to pay for food? You can't tell me that they didn't have some big unanswered questions. Like, God, where are you in all of this? Now, when you think with me, the angel comes and talks to Mary, tells Mary that she's highly favored, that she's going to be pregnant but out of wedlock. Now, in this society, it may fly. But in that society, it didn't fly. Her early pregnancy would be filled with scandal and mocking. How was she going to be able to explain this to Joseph? Fortunately, God intervened at the right time, and Mary and Joseph got married. Then she had to travel to Bethlehem in the ninth month of her pregnancy. The baby was born, and then they had to flee to Egypt and live as refugees for two years. Then they returned to Nazareth. Jesus was 12, and they decided as a family to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. Passover. 
and they lose Jesus? You, know, that's, you just don't lose the Son of God. That's not a good thing. Uh, for years, Mary and Joseph waited to see what their son was going to do. And then Jesus starts his earthly ministry around age 30, and there's this buzz going around that he's possibly the Messiah. He does incredible miracles. He teaches authoritatively. And then Mary watches her son get crucified and die. Devastation. Well, then he rose again, and he hangs around for 40 days, and then he tells the people he's going to go away, but he's going to come back again. And it's been nearly 2,000 years since he said he was going to return. Now, I share all that for a lot of reasons, but one reason is this. If you're going to follow the Lord... You need to expect times of waiting, times of wondering, times of questioning, times where doubt creeps in, and God would sit back and say, the Christian life is a life of waiting. It's a life of trusting as you wait, and a time of rejoicing when you see God act. You ought to jot that down somewhere. Waiting, trusting, rejoicing. And it all is sums up really in God saying to us, no matter what you're going through, trust me. And let me give you the definition of trust, and I don't think I wrote it down for you. It is believing God enough to do what he says. Trust is believing God enough to do what he says. And with that said, let's look at this. God works in the shadows. I want you to remember, Mary and Joseph didn't know why they had to make the trip to Bethlehem except for there was a census and they had to go there to register for that census. But the real truth was they needed to be in Bethlehem when Jesus was born in order to fulfill prophecy. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So God was working in the shadows with Caesar so that he would issue a decree for a census to, in order to get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. God was at work in that. Now, for us, normally we don't see what God is doing by looking out the front windshield. A lot of times God's working and we look out and see, try to figure out what he's doing this way, and we can't figure out what he's doing. But it's only when we look through the back rear view mirror or back through the windshield in the back, we say, oh, so that's what you were up to. We must never forget that God works in the shadows. He's always at work. He's never caught off guard. He always knows what's coming. And when confusion sets in for us, when the darkness and the circumstances overshadow our lives, and we can't see anything good, God is at work in the shadows. And we must trust Him. Trust Him that He is at work. I'll give you another example of God being at work in the shadows. There were wise men that came from the east to see Jesus. Undoubtedly lived in the land of Persia. You ask, why in the world would they have known when the star appeared that a king had been born? Well, there happened to be a prophet that lived in Persia. 600 years prior to that, his name was Daniel. And Daniel, as a prophet of God, would have told people that one day there's a king that's going to be born, and he's going to be the king of the Jews. And that story would have gone through all the, the wise men of Persia and, and all those that studied the stars. And so when they saw the star, they knew that a king had been born. It had been born in Jerusalem. And so they began to make plans for that long trip to Jerusalem. Then they traveled to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, a star reappeared over the house of Joseph and Mary and where Jesus was living. You say, a house? Wasn't it the 
cave or the, the stable. No, by the time Jesus was born, gone to Jerusalem, they didn't make their trip back to Nazareth yet. They evidently rented a house to stay in. And uh, they came to this house, and they came and they worshipped, and they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. Then Herod issued a decree that they were to go out and kill every boy child under the age of two. The angel warned Joseph and Mary, and they fled to Egypt. Now remember, they're the poorest of the poor. And you ask the question, how did they finance that trip? And how did they finance living in Egypt for two years and their journey back to Nazareth? Gold. God had been working in the situation, in the shadows, in order to enable this to happen. They had no idea what God was doing. I want you to listen to Isaiah 55, and I've got it in your notes. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, every time I read that, I remind myself, He's God, I'm not. Okay? And when we go through tough times and confusing times and endless waiting, you've got to remember, God is at work in the shadows. He doesn't need to explain himself to us. He just says to us, I want you to trust me. I've got it under control. Remember when you're raising your kids and your kids hit that age called the why stage? You tell them to why. Why? 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 I'll tell you, I must have heard of why a thousand times a day. It drives you nuts because you really don't know if you should answer them or not. But then remember the time you sat down to answer their why question? And after you got done, they're just looking at you like, they didn't understand a word you said. You know why? Because uh, your thoughts and your understanding were beyond their ability to comprehend. So God doesn't let us in on his thoughts because normally we wouldn't understand. He just says, trust me. I like that. I can understand those two words. Trust me. Now, God shows up in the crisis, though. He's at work in the shadows. He shows up in the crisis. Now, personally, I'd like him to show up before the crisis. Make an announcement. This is coming, but this is what I'm going to do. Doesn't happen. The angel comes and talks to Mary and says to Mary, you're highly favored, but you're going to be pregnant. God knew that she was going to need confirmation, that she was carrying the Son of God. And so God tells her through the angel to go visit Elizabeth, her relative. Elizabeth is six months pregnant. See, God was already at work six months before so that two elderly people would conceive a child and that child that Elizabeth was carrying was going to be John the Baptist. So when Mary arrives, the baby that is in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy, and Elizabeth confirms to Mary, Mary, you are the blessed one. You're the one carrying the Son of God. See, God was at work in the crisis and showed up at just the right time with the right message. When Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem, there was no room in the inn. My response is, for crying out loud, Lord, couldn't you have made a room in the inn? Couldn't you have made somebody late so they they could give her room? But God already knew. And he had a, a stable or a cave that he had chosen for them out of the way where she could give birth in private where shepherds could come and worship the baby without uh, drawing attention to the situation. When Herod ordered all the boys to be killed in that area under the age of two, God showed up. Right at the right time, sent an angel to tell Joseph and Mary, flee to Egypt until Herod is dead. 
When Jesus died on the cross, I really don't think anybody knew it was all part of God's plan to bring salvation to all the world to those who would believe in His Son. Those were dark days for everyone. Dead for three days, not a peep from God, but God was always at work. And then God showed up and raised Jesus from the dead. Hallelujah. And then Jesus ascended into heaven, promised he was going to come back. The disciples did what they were told, go and wait for 10 days and pray. And so they prayed, and God sent the Holy Spirit to live within them. He started the church. And for 2,000 years, he's been building his church. And billions of people have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And billions of people are waiting for the return of Jesus to take the church home to be with him. Three points. God is at work in the shadows. God shows up in the crisis. And the last point we don't have to spend much time on is he always does it by his own timetable. He does it when he chooses to do it. And it's still true today. So we wait for God to work in a situation that we're facing today, or we're waiting for him to return and take us home to be with himself. During that period of time, we simply need to trust him. Uh, trust him enough to do what he tells you to do now, even though you don't see him working now. Songwriter got it right. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And God says uh, in the Christian life there is waiting, but God is always working. There's trusting as you wait, and there's rejoicing when he acts. And when you're facing a trial, and when life is somewhat confusing, and when you sense that you're surrounded by darkness, God says, you're going to have to trust me. I'm always working in the shadows. The problem is, as Christians, we go into a situation and uh, we want to escape that situation. We want to bail out of that situation. So my encouragement is this, don't bail out or you might miss out on what God is going to do. Sometimes we like to wiggle our way out of something. Sometimes we like to pull a few strings. We see that we can get out of a situation by sacrificing a little bit of our integrity to change the situation, or we might lie about something in order to wiggle out of the problem. Well, if we do that, we're going to miss out on what God wanted to do. So it's better to sit back and say, okay, I can't get out of this thing in a righteous way, so I'm not going to wiggle out of it. I'm going to let God work. We've got to trust God. Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And Proverbs chapter 5 and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He's going to direct your paths. Now, I'm only going to focus in on that first phrase, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the sovereign Lord. Trust in the one who is in absolute total control. And don't lean on your own understanding, okay? Don't think about the situation. It's okay to think about the situation, but don't lean on your brain power, okay? Because it's going to fail. You ever have a yardstick, a wooden yardstick? The yardstick is good for measuring. But have you ever leaned on a yardstick? When you do, it snaps. God sits back and says, hey, your brain is there for a reason, but don't lean on it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. You say, but how do you trust in the Lord? When it seems like life is crushing in around us, when there isn't any solution to the problem, let me tell you a story from the Old Testament. Josiah was a good king. He was a king of Judah. He had a glorious reign. He did a lot of religious reform and the people were walking with God during his reign as king. He was no longer the king. The nation fell back into moral decline. God was about to discipline and was disciplining Israel. 
by bringing Babylon, or disciplining Judah, by bringing Babylon to threaten them. And Habakkuk says this in Habakkuk chapter 1, and I wrote it down for you. These are his words to God. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you don't save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. Their strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Now, Habakkuk is honest with God. He's confused. And he says to God, how can a righteous God seemingly overlook evil? How can a good God allow such evil to happen? How can a loving God allow people to suffer? Good questions, huh? You've ever asked them? You have. But after presenting his frustration to God, he writes in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 and 19, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though the, there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Savior, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on heights. Now, just like Habakkuk, at some point, we have to come to the place where we stop demanding that we understand what God is doing and why, and we ultimately just say, I'm going to trust God. Even though I don't understand, I'm going to trust God even though nothing makes sense. I'm going to trust God even if basic needs aren't being met. We need to place our trust in God. Now, one alternative is to become very angry and full of despair and become bitter at God. The other alternative is to, now you ought to hear this and you ought to write it down because there's nothing magical about trusting God. The other alternative is to make a conscience, conscious decision to trust God. You're simply going to say, I have decided I am going to trust God. <coughs> Jill Briscoe wife of Stuart Briscoe, he's a pastor of a church, or was a pastor of a church in Milwaukee, and she tells a story about her lifelong friend. Her friend's name was Anne. Anne was married to a policeman. There was a shooting, and the first seven policemen that were killed were all born-again Christians. And Anne's husband was one of the seven that were killed. Well, Jill went out to the funeral. And uh, in her mind were these words running through, well, where was God? Was he standing on the corner with his hands in the pocket? Why didn't he look after his own? And these words are running through her mind and and before she had any chance to greet anybody, one of the widows of the policeman uh, came up to her and said, without any bitterness in her voice, what a blessing it was our husbands who were killed. They knew the Lord. Just imagine if it had been the young policeman who didn't know Christ. That didn't ease the pain. The pain was deep. The loss was great. The confusion was still enormous. It was a needless tragedy, but their overriding trust in God saw them through. 
They trusted in the goodness of God even in a bad situation. You know, we have a choice. We can trust in the goodness of God and the love of God and live in hope, or we can turn from Him in bitterness and live in despair. It's our choice. Okay? Don't ask God to send some magical thing to make you trust Him. No. He says, trust me. Trust me. Elizabeth Elliot was a young wife and a mother. She was serving as a missionary in the Ecuadorian jungle. Her husband, Jim Elliott, and four other missionaries were trying to reach a, a remote tribe called the Alcas. But on a sunny day, the Alcas speared and killed all five missionary men. It was an enormous tragedy. It could have left the wives wallowing in bitterness. But Elizabeth Elliot didn't wallow in bitterness. Nor did she simply resign herself to her fate. But she placed her trust in God and surrendered to God's very difficult will for her life. And she writes about the difference between resignation and trust. I'm just going to read it to you. Resignation is surrender to fate. Acceptance is surrendered to God. Resignation lies down quietly in an empty universe. Acceptance rises up to meet the God who fills the universe with purpose and destiny. Resignation says, I can't. God says, I can. Resignation says, it's all over for me. Acceptance says, now that I'm here, Lord, what's next? Resignation says, what a waste. Acceptance says, in what redemptive way can you use this mess, Lord? Elizabeth Elliot faithfully served the Lord, and she has seen the very people who killed her husband come to faith in Jesus Christ. It was the death of her husband and the other missionaries that opened up the way for the gospel to be brought to the Alka tribe. And Marge Saint, who lost her husband, Nate, in the same attack, also went back to the Alka tribe with Elizabeth to present the gospel to the Alka tribe. Marge Saint's daughter, Kathy, was only an infant when her father was killed. And she relates her experience. You say, at one? No. Listen to what she says. I remember at age 15, I stood in the river where my father died. And I was baptized by the man who killed my father. And the man who killed my father is now the pastor of that tribe. Here are people who made a decision. I will trust God. And God said to them, return to the Alka tribe and preach the gospel. So they returned, they trusted God and obeyed God... They didn't know how it was going to pay off. They remained faithful to what God called them to do. And God did what God had determined to do. Perhaps you're in a waiting room. You don't understand the situations that are going on in your life. You're in a waiting room. In that waiting room, it's not fair. And you may wonder, does God love me or hate me? And you aren't sure if you're ever going to get out of the waiting room or if the circumstances are ever going to change. You aren't convinced that God is working in the shadows because you can't see any evidence of his working. Let me leave you with this story. A young woman was sitting on a rock 
overlooking a lake. She was praying and pleading with God that she, what she needed soon would come now. And she said, God, I can't see you working. I'm praying. Others are praying. The situation is terrible. What are you doing about it? She became silent. And soon God spoke to her and said to her, Are there any fish in the lake? The woman looked out at the lake. It was just, just like glass. The woman said, sure, there are fish in the lake. And God spoke to her and said, how do you know? Do you need to see the fish jump to believe that they're there? After sitting for another hour by herself in silence, she responded and said to God, if I never see fish jump, I will believe that they are there and active. And if I never see you answer a prayer, I will believe that you are there and active. Wow. Remember Job? Job's wife comes to Job and says, curse God and die. I don't want you to forget, Job's wife went through what Job went through. She had lost all of her children. She had lost their houses. She had lost their servants. She had lost the cattle. She had lost their livelihood. She had lost the wealth too. And now she has to watch her husband just sit there with boils all over her body. And her response is, curse God and die. You know, when you're in a waiting room, you can curse God and die. Or you can deliberately choose to trust God and grow. There's only one thing God wants from us. Trust Him. Trust Him. Let's pray. Lord, if everything was going well for us every day, we wouldn't be challenged to trust You. But life is full of trials and tribulations, and some come and are very life-changing. And sometimes we're convinced that uh, the trials will never be overcome. But you say, trust me. Believe that while we're waiting, that you are at work. That you're working in the shadows even though we can't see you. That you will show up at some point in time in the crisis when you'll do it in your own timetable. And Lord, it's hard to trust you because you don't always explain yourself. But may we decide today to make a conscious, deliberate decision to trust you. And may we manifest our trust by believing you enough to obey you while we go through the tough times. And Lord, if there's someone here who has never put their trust in Jesus Christ, has never experienced the saving, forgiving, uh, cleansing power of Jesus Christ in their life, I just pray that they might cry out to you and say, Lord, I want to step over that line. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I, today, I want to receive Christ as my Savior and Lord. May that happen today for them, and they pray this, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.